In our final episode, we get to welcome the train to the podcast once again. How appropriate that a train happens to go by just as you're talking about the... <laughs> it's it's yeah. diving into a tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, hurry up. I was trying to finish this up. Inside this room, all of my dreams become realities, and some of my realities become dreams. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? It's alive! It's alive! You are listening to the Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute. Here are your hosts, Alan Sanders and Walt Murray. Welcome back to the Wilder Ride, getting wilder by the minute, a podcast where we are breaking down and celebrating the Gene Wilder film, Young Frankenstein, one sweet mystery of life. At last I found you, minute at a time. I'm Alan Sanders, your host. And I'm Walt Murray, your co-host. And joining us one more time, Dave D'Alessandro of the Seinfeld Minute. Dave, welcome back. Hi, guys. It's good to be back. Good to have you here where uh, we, we've we saved a couple of things, a little nuggets for our audience. As we told everyone yesterday, you wanted to talk about the, the Frankenstein walk. We wanted to talk about what we're planning to do next week for the true last minute. I'm thinking of this as sort of our last last minute only because it's the last time we have any actual live action on screen. We really don't have – we have one more minute of sort of post-movie credits And we've got something special. We'll wait till the end of this minute to tell you what we plan to bring you next week. So let's go ahead and remind everybody where we are as we are wrapping up the film Young Frankenstein. We start off with Dr. Frankenstein moaning with his sort of zombie-like walk, getting into bed with Inga. And we end, as I said, pulling back from where we started so long ago, the camera pushing into the castle. It does the reverse, starts to pull away from the castle on the hill with the credits beginning to roll, the end credits. So Dave, let's start off with you because you said you wanted to go into this walk, this iconic walk for the first time we see a a true callback to how Boris Karloff attacked the creature Frankenstein's monster. Oh, see, that's what everybody thinks. But uh, I, have, I must, I'm sorry, but I must correct you there. I, I figured According I set to... that table for you. <laughs> oh, well, well, I walked right into that bear trap, didn't I, then? <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> According to Gilbert Godfrey and his podcast, <laughs> uh, he... He was a uh, he's a monster movie fanatic you know, ever since he was a kid. He claims that the the Frankenstein walk that everybody does with the arms stretched out was actually only in the Ghost of Frankenstein, portrayed by Lon Chaney Jr. And uh, the reason why he had his arms stretched out was in that movie there was a deleted scene where the monster is reanimated, you know, back to life, and he's temporarily blinded. So he gets up off the uh, table, stands up, tries to walk around, but can't see anything. So he sticks out his arms to try to feel around. And that's where that stereotypical walk came from. Wow. Von Chaney Jr. and not, in fact, Boris Karloff. But it's so funny how the the th- these things just all of a sudden take on a life of their own in sort of that cultural handing down of what we think we know because we see people do it. We see it in sitcoms. We see it in movies. And so we just assume, oh, well, if they're parodying the Frankenstein monster, it must mean the Boris Karloff Frankenstein. That's right. It's sort of like that the whole- stiff-legged and the stiff-arm move combination. That's what everybody thinks of when you think of Frankenstein. Right. It's sort of, for a, a, for our age range, because th- we weren't alive to watch the Frankenstein movies when they first were released, but for our age, Walt, and, and Dave, maybe for you, the, the, the iconic line, be me up, Scotty. There is no time ever in the Star Trek series that Kirk or anybody uses those exact words that way. Nobody ever says, be me up, Scotty. And yet everyone says Yeah, there says are many it. derivatives of the phrase, but no exact not, – not an exact – No, it actually – I know what you're saying. It came from a bumper sticker someone made a bajillion dollars on selling a bumper sticker that said, Beam me up, Scotty. Mel Brooks ah. uses it in Spaceballs. Shall I have snotty beam you down, sir? I don't know about that beaming stuff. Is it safe? Oh, yes, sir. Snotty beam me twice last night. It was wonderful. All right. I'll take a shot at it. What the ah! It works on Star Trek. That's right. Where he's like, is that beaming good? He goes, well, Scotty beamed me last night. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, and it is the callback line to Star Trek. Anybody, you know, if you want to remind somebody of Star Trek, that's the one you use. And, you know, going through this movie, it is funny that we've talked about the flathead, mm-hmm. the bolt through the neck. And I guess both of those yeah. are owned by bolt Universal. Yep. And oh, you can't have bolts on the neck without paying Universal some money. You can't have a flathead or bolts. That is a licensed image through 2026. Oh my gosh. Isn't that crazy? You have the green skin, which is the iconic. You can do everything else pretty much the same, but you can't you can't have the iconic makeup from the original Boris Karloff grown? look. Is that allowed? Is the grown, grown is allowed. allowed. Yep, yeah. grown is allowed. The 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 undersized jacket, the over <laughs> the tattered pants, the giant boots, everything. It's it's the iconic head that Universal owns the trade the trademark is it a trademark? I guess it's, yeah, a, it's trademark a trademark of yeah, I think of that so. of that franchise. That's why uh, the Munsters, and we talked about this back when we we mentioned this, when we, when we stumbled across that fact way back, I think in minutes 60-ish or so, maybe even before that, that Universal MCA's television studio that did the Munsters was able to put Fred Gwynn's makeup on to look like the Boris Karloff because it was a Universal property. Ah. But that's why if you look at all the other Frankenstein movies that are put on by other people, the Hammer films that came out in the 60s, mm-hmm. all the iterations, if it wasn't a universal picture, they have all they can have a mashed up face, that, but they can't have that iconic flathead. Do they have kind of a gray makeup palette as well? Or they can have whatever. Black and white. Can't really tell anyway. You can have whatever you want. Color wise, it's, it's just the, for some reason, it's, it's the head and the bolts in the neck. Yeah. So instead, we replace it in Young Frankenstein with a zipper in the neck. <laughs> and uh, a bald head. <laughs> yeah, and a bald head. <laughs> we'll show you. But I mean, he was already bald at the time. Why did you even need to make a? Why did you need to put a bald cap on Peter Boyle's head? Well, yeah, you know, I think it's bald- the. The 50s. I think it's the reverse. I think the reason you see that line is they try to put makeup from like the forehead down and they just left the left the crown of his head right where it was. So <laughs> Yeah, because I think they built up his eyebrows. Right. Like the forehead and everything forehead. to make it a little yeah. thicker and wider. Mm-hmm. And then you could see where they just eh, just leave it right there. Yeah. <laughs> Good enough. We're in minute 104, 105, 106. <laughs> Forget it. All right. Well, so it's not like they actually shot the movie in sequence. So as far as they're concerned, this could have been shot, you know, much earlier on. Oh, sure. And there was so much shot. I mean, for them, it would have been minute two seventy eight. Well, I'm assuming yeah. they did everything in the bedroom, probably all within weeks those of each probably, like within the, yeah. you know, there's probably all scheduled. The way, and for folks who maybe already know this, then they're boring. Like, oh my god, don't tell me about how movies are made. But when you think about on a set. <laughs> You're not going to listen to this podcast. You're interested in how movies are made. Well, so. that's true. That's true. I hate to disagree with you there, but you know, uh, I must. You're not going to spend all this time dressing a room or a lab or uh, a jail cell or a town hall and then say, well, we'll be back in like 25 days to shoot again right. here. We're not doing a sitcom where we may move all around. We're going to try to get everything done here. Well, we've got all the lights here. We've got the actors here. We're going to schedule the actors to shoot that we need, the extras we need. For the next day or three days or, 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 or a week, maybe, just depending on how much they're shooting. And then they'll go to the next location. And that's why, as a movie actor, I used to think, because I'm a stage actor, I started off as a stage actor. I used to think, oh, these movie actors, they only have to worry about a couple of minutes at a time and that's it. No, it's really hard to keep a continuity of performance when you have no idea what day, you're, what you're shooting and how it falls in the script. And to have in your head how I need to act because of stuff we haven't even shot yet. But I got to make sure, well, we had that trouble with this podcast. We were starting to yes, record it out of order and had to keep track of it. Yeah. And I, I can tell you, recording this week has been great because I know <laughs> yeah. the last week. All in order. Scenes we're doing. And yeah, and, and we're doing them in order. That's kind of a a, a, a nice change from the last 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Let me, a uh, quick tip for all of you wannabe, uh, if you're like, oh my God, this was so much fun, I want to do it too, which is what I did after doing the thing minute. I was like, oh my God, I want to do this too. Uh, try, if at all possible, to shoot or to record in order. Because Absolutely. when you are all over the place, Dave, I don't know if you've ever had that happen. We actually recorded yeah. some minutes, two months before the next following minutes, and then we it was all over the place. And we had to remember, well, what did we talk about? And, and so far- Oh, there's no chance. Yeah, you're never going to remember that stuff. It was, I think we only had one minute where I listened back and I texted Walt. I said, we kind of- it had a little bit of a flub between what we talked about yesterday and what we talked about today, but uh, for the most part, we got lucky. Yeah, we did. I guess it helps that we love this movie. It, it does. And we've had great guests. That we has have. helped a lot. Yeah, we have. So, so all right. Well, we recorded a Seinfeld minute. We were only off by one. Like we, I think we were on 12 or 13, 
and then we skipped ahead to 15, and then went back to 14 to continue on. And that, just that little bit screwed us up. That may have been worse. It screwed us up pretty bad. Well, it's, I, I don't care what, what you're doing in terms of this medium. It's hard to record out of order. It is. It is. But it's also hard to record in order because you have certain people who want to do certain scenes and who have an affinity for that scene in yeah. some way. So well, the, getting uh, people If you always have the same guests on, it's only like two people doing it or you're doing it yourself. That's one thing. But it's not as much fun as having other people sit in and getting no, their perspective of it. So. I totally agree. I think in terms of lessons, I, I don't want to even call it like lessons learned since we're sort of wrapping up. And it's, But I think what I learned going through this is it was worth having the heck the headache of rescheduling and shifting around to have the various voices. I think that no I will question. always err on the side of more guests rather than less. Yeah. Because there's only so Good. much that people can put up with of, of me and Alan. <laughs> <laughs> you just put a negative spin. Very true. <laughs> so for our listeners – uh, thank you <laughs> for, for enduring. <laughs> we, <laughs> thanks for sticking with us, <laughs> Dave. You, so you you busted this, this the myth. I mean, it, technically, Frankenstein's monster at some point does do the Frankenstein walk, but it was not Boris Karloff who brought that to the screen. And it, it's nice to be yes. able to, to kind of bust that and get people some things like that. Well, one of the things that I think yeah, when we, I heard that when I heard that on uh, Gilbert's podcast, I was blown away by it because I was like, "You got to be kidding!" I mean, that's what everybody. Thinks thinks of is that walk and to hear it from him if he if he in fact if it is true i mean it's i hate to use hyperbole but i, I was blown away it was it was staggering to hear that kind of a thing and i was it's very satisfied when you pick up little nuggets like that of uh trivia that yeah. you get to pass on to other people well and to me it's always interesting to to hear about things like that because that is one of the the things that you just think of when you think of frankenstein and so when you find out that it is something that really only happened for about a minute in one movie towards the end yeah. of that towards original sequel, run, that. yeah, right, and not one of the um, one of the primary movies you think of when you think of Frankenstein, but yet it has become a part of our our cultural identity of Frankenstein, right? And it's so something for me, we forever associate with him, and it for whatever reason it just has always. It's forever associated with him. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think that's known as the Mandela effect. If you're familiar with that, well, isn't the Mandela effect when you think you know something and it turns out you're totally wrong? Like the beam me up, Scotty, is the right. Mandela effect. Right, and there's a bathroom on the right. That kind of thing. Right, or um, oh, what's the? There's there's several of them that you can pull. Luke, I am your father. He doesn't right. say doesn't Luke, say I'm that. your father. Yeah, right. Everybody right. goes, no, he right. said Luke. He goes, no, he just goes, no, I am your father. No, I am your father. father. Right. But everybody yeah. goes, no, no, no. Just remember, they, they changed just remembered it. Just remembered lyrics and uh, <laughs> movie lines, that sort of thing. Yeah. I, lo I love that. I love when people are like, I swear to God, they changed it. No, they, no. no. Yes, yeah, you're right. They released it in the theater, <laughs> but then when they went back and they changed all the video copies of it just to screw with you. Right. Because <laughs> they were like, hey, remember that line that everybody loved? Let's change it. Like the, oh, oh, the one I was thinking about was the Cary Grant, Judy, Judy, Judy. Oh, he never yeah. said that. Yeah, yeah. And everybody does that. Everybody when they're imitating Cary Grant. They do Judy, Judy, Judy. And, and he, he never, never did that. It. It's funny. All right. Well, yeah, we perhaps should... he did it on, as he, maybe he guessed it on. I remember seeing him on an episode of the Flintstones as a cartoon where he might have said something very similar to that. But uh, again, it's, I'm, all, I'm a little off track here, but yeah. Well, oh, and, and then ahead. sometimes it becomes, you know, something that is like the comedian's way of beating up on something or whatever becomes iconic towards that person. Like, um, What's her face? Who ran for vice president a few years ago with uh, the whole thing of oh I can see Russia from my house? Oh Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. Yeah, when Saturday Night Live kind of panned her with that. Well, she never said anything that ridiculous. No, she didn't. It got quoted as the Saturday Night Live skit. Right. But if you ask people now, everybody thinks everybody that thinks she that she says said that. that. Right. Yes. Ah. Uh, so. Yeah. That's that's a, that's a similar uh, phenomenon. Yes. Yeah, right. and it's just interesting to see how things like that get into our culture and become indelible. Well, you know what they always say, the lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets out of bed. Oh, interesting. That's yes. always been one of those propaganda Who things. Who says that? I've never heard that before. You've never heard that phrase? Alan says it every morning on his radio show. <laughs> I hear it every day. No, it's you've never heard, seriously, you've never heard that phrase that the lie no, gets No, I've never heard that. Yeah. As, uh, That's a good lie. 
It's uh, it's about something about propaganda and stuff. And I think it was I hate to see. I'm going to cut all this out because I don't want to talk about Goebbels and politics. <laughs> right. But apparently, I think it was Goebbels came up with the idea that if you get the lie out there fast enough, that by the time the truth catches up, no one will believe it. But that phrase, I've, I've heard that my whole life. That uh, with media and cable news and instantaneous, and now with social media, it's even worse. That the the misinformation gets reported first, and then nobody bothers to check the correction. <laughs> Let's uh let's get back to the joke. minute though, because I I I've got a I know Terry Gar <laughs> is using a, a a German accent, and I know she and she's done a pretty good job through it. She has, but the feeling's mutual. The feeling is mutual. The heck is mutual? Yeah, that's a. That <laughs> it sounds like she's she butchered mutual. it. Mutual. <laughs> mutual. Mutual. I, I think she kind of struggles in this in this minute because I also noticed when she's singing. She's kind of struggling with some of the words. Well, it sounds like she's struggling with the monster. Yeah. Oh, I don't believe. Oh, ah, oh, oh. And she is struggling with the monster. So let me ask you this, Walt, because we had we had to we had to handle the Elizabeth creature scene with 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 delicate gloves in our current climate. I'm thinking when I when they cut away from the zoom in on his eyes and he goes and he like leans over and then all of a sudden we cut the fireplace. I wonder. Are we supposed to get the idea that he is the monster? Because she sounds like she's struggling. Like, it sounds like she's fighting him off until she sings. Yes. I I kind of So she finally accepted the same thing. Much like the scene earlier with uh, the monster. With Elizabeth. Elizabeth where yeah. she's, you know, she's scared and then she finally accepts him. You know, woof. And I thought the whole thing. Yeah. This scene is echoed uh, from that previous scene. Yeah. And I had never really thought about it until we... Until I was preparing for this minute, but I was like, well, there are now two uncomfortable. Yeah, because it sounds like I'm movie. singing because I know. It, two moments that you can't watch with your kids. Right. Yes. Well, and here's the thing. The first time I saw it, because when I went to go back to rewatch the movie, I was like, oh, this is where when she says, you know, what did you get from him? And I think, oh, my gosh, he's turned into the monster. Maybe he's strangling her. or Maybe it, it ends on a dark note. Now you realize when she starts to sing. like oh okay it is mirroring the other scene which again in our current climate it's like is he forcing himself i mean inga says the feelings mutual i want to be with you i can't wait it's our wedding night it's not like they haven't already done it we we saw them earlier lowering from the, the the table but all of a sudden it sounds like she's struggling so my initial thought was oh maybe he's turned into the monster and he's trying to hurt her and then she starts singing he's like oh no. So then why was she why was she not into it? And it feels really oh, a little, a little, yeah, weird. Maybe it's a little bit of rough play just to uh, get her in the mood, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> rough play. Maybe that's just what I, maybe that's just what I want it uh, to be. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is one we just don't speculate about. And, uh, yeah. Everything's fine. Just uh, look at the fire and uh, watch the fire. <laughs> All right. Move on. Nothing to see here. Please disperse. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see. I do think it is funny how it does mirror what happened with Elizabeth in the sense that she, using the song, hitting sort of sort of the operatic crescendo of being in full joy and ecstasy of the moment. I do like it. And I love the bringing that back of the sweet mystery of life at last I found you. Mm -hmm. It does tie it all back together. And so we do end, and we now know. What did you get from the monster? So I need to sign up for some um, for my trans trans mutation. That's mute. a dental trans and dental trans transubstantiation. Polar trans. trans. We, how did that word get out of our freaking head again? Transference. Transference. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna write that to, in my notes. I need here. to sign up for a transference somewhere. I just got to figure out who. Can to you go tell with. us our last episode of the season? <laughs> <laughs> We're done. Or is it? <laughs> the brain's fried. <laughs> well, and, you know, I hate to blow the mystery here, but we just recorded the previous minute about half an hour ago. So the fact that you can't remember the word transference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, We're not burned out. We're just dumb. Yeah, exactly. It's... uh. It takes a lot of skill to, to act like we don't know what we're talking about. Yes, it does. We're really working uh, hard at it. all on purpose. Yes. You know, yes. like when they film the movie within the movie, you know, like like Boogie Nights, yes. when you get like, they're, they're really bad actors when they're on the porn set, but then obviously they're really good actors to be in the movie they're in. Right. It's really hard, hard actually, to act bad. To act bad. It uh, is. Yeah. 
or closer to home, how Madeline Kahn, we told that story, how learning to sing badly in Blazing Saddles was really hard for her because yeah. she was a classically trained uh, singer. So on a music note, we got it. We've got one more character we got to say bye to. And we end oh, before, with the shot. Before okay. we do that, though, before we do that, sorry to cut you off there, but I got a few, I got a few little nuggets here about the sweet mystery of life. Okay. The Ah Sweet Mystery of Life was a song by Victor Hubert uh, from the score of the play Naughty Marietta from 1910. It was later made into a film in 1935, the same year that Bride of Frankenstein came out. And in that film, Madame Donard was played by Elsa Lancaster, the Bride of Frankenstein. Oh, that's a nice tie-in. Really? That and, is uh, awesome. There, yes, you know, I, I try to do my research. I, I dug that up uh, last night. I was so proud to write that down. I'm like, oh, wait, these guys get a load of this one. That, I I, I don't think we uh, we realized that. Yeah. Well, that's why you guys brought me on board. We did. That's right. We, that, that was the one reason we brought you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we need somebody who wants to do research. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And also, there were uh, additional lyrics for se- several of Victor Hubert's songs were written by Gus Kahn, no relation to Madeline Kahn. Oh, <laughs> man, I was thinking, if you're going to tell me that that's Madeline Kahn's there? dad. No, no, it's not. Yeah, no, her dad was not named Gus. <laughs> it was actually, actually, she was adopted by a fellow named Hiller Kahn after her parents divorced when she was two. Oh. Her birth name was Madeline Gail Wolfson. Again, once again, referencing Lon Chaney Jr. as uh, the Wolfman. She was Wolf's son. Hmm. A bit of a stretch, but... Uh, we'll go with it. Yeah, well. We'll, we'll allow it's it. a bonus. Well, the cool thing, if you remember when we talked about it the first time, when we had Pete Mummert joining us during that uncomfortable first scene with Elizabeth, and we talked about Naughty Marietta, the idea of the song is about somebody who's trying to get out of an, of an arranged marriage that was supposed to be the, quote, marriage you're supposed to have instead of the marriage she wants to have. And it sort of made a nice parallel using that lyric to not only be funny for hitting your Shangri-La moment, but also saying, Elizabeth was never right for the doctor. She was right, apparently, for the creature. And so, kind of nice parallel back, we get Inga, we always realize these two should be together, and so we get that repetition of Inga, who wasn't supposed to necessarily be with the doctor, she was only supposed to be the lab assistant, she actually ends up being with the guy she wants to be with, instead of some other prearranged thing. So it ends up being uh, a double meaning, and I like that. Yeah, it all comes back to uh, where it should be. It is a happy ending. It, it is. all settles back into place. Yes. Well, well done. Let's remind everybody a little factoid that I dug up, bef- uh, and we, we mentioned it a while ago, but since we are wrapping up, the original first version or first draft, Gene Wilder said, you know, initially I wanted to make a Frankenstein movie with a happy ending, but his initial first draft, he thought the only way to stop the monsters from ever being created is for Dr. Frankenstein to die. And so he was supposed to be thrown off the cliff at the end of the movie. And so there'd be no more Frankenstein lineage. Jeez. So I don't know if that would have been a happy ending. <laughs> I kind of like this one better. I think they went with the better ending. That uh, <laughs> glad he was. T- I'm glad Mel didn't have to talk him out of that one. Yeah, no kidding. You know, there was also another bizarre ending that was shot. Have you seen this in any of the outtakes or anything where the entire cast comes down the stairs in the main entryway and individually dances by the camera? That had to have been something for just like a for the fun of it. I don't think that was for the film. That was actually considered as one of the endings. Outtake reel or something. Yes. No. Well, no. It's an outtake reel now. But I have they, not. Seen they had this. actually considered using that as an ending to this movie, and it is. It's interesting. Almost like the ending of a play. Where everybody thinks yes, about. That's exactly the, the feeling that they that wanted it to have. Uh, and um, I'm glad they did not hmm. do that. Even though it's kind of I a neat thing to watch. Well into film. Yeah, and you'll find it on YouTube. Okay, I need, to, I need to see it. I, it. It might be interesting. It would have been interesting to have as sort of a bonus. Now that we have DVDs and CDs, yes. you could do something like yeah. that. I do know Gene Wilder kept going to Mel Brooks and saying, can we come up with some, adi- some other stuff to shoot? Because he didn't want to stop. He, he had so much fun seeing his, oh, yeah. his yeah, script come to life too. that eventually Mel Brooks said, look, we've got to wrap this yeah, up. Yeah, we're done. It makes me wonder if maybe they did that for just – for Gene's benefit, maybe they maybe they shot a scene like that just to have one more day on the set. Maybe, maybe because it, it definitely doesn't have the feel of the movie. It has, you know, like you said, Dave, it has a feel of, of a play ending. And, yeah, you know, the cast coming out and you know, kind of a final uh, goodbye to the to the uh, world. All right. Well, before we 
get into Igor on the on the castle. I think we should probably go back to the script since we're talking about the script. And let me just go ahead and, and we we did this a couple of days ago when we were trying to show the difference in some of these scenes. Let me show you how this was originally supposed to be shot and some of the dialogue that they've dropped and changed around. It's supposed to start off with back to the castle, Inga's voice off screen. Did you have a nice day? And we talked about this already, Walt, that he's supposed to say, oh, just the usual sore throats, a few colds, two bladder transplants, and someone thought he was a werewolf. Then Inga, did you notice the new drapes I put up in the bedroom? Freddy, yes, they're very nice. I like them. Inga, oh, good. There's a short pause. Inga begins humming, and that's where we get her singing, and then we see he's becoming transfixed. Inga's voice, I was hoping you'd like them, continues to sing. Freddy, who is, was reading the newspaper, is lowering the paper now, seeing his eyes start to become transfixed. Inga, all right if I turn out the lamp, sweetheart? Freddy, mmm. She turns out the lamp, goes on humming. Now the bedroom is lit only by moonlight and the glow of the fire. Inga, as she's arranging her pillow, shall I set the alarm? Mmm. Then she goes on humming. She pulls up the stopper on the alarm clock. Freddy rises. His arms hang away from his body stiffly. He walks in fits and jerks. Freddy. Mm. Inga. Yes, sweetie, I heard you. So I'm ready for you, mein lieb. Freddy is standing at the edge of the bed. Are you ready for me? Freddy. Mm. Ready for boom boom mocking? Mmm, oh Inga, I love it when you're excited. Come then, my apfelstrudel. Come into my arms and let me hold you. Freddy kneels onto the bed, a long pause. Inga, sweetheart, is this really you? Mm. And then we cut to Igor on the edge of the castle. So that was how it was going to be shot when they made some changes on the fly. So once yeah, a again, bit trimming back. Yeah, the they did a great job of trimming it back. Getting rid of the stupid dialogue, yeah, would have been way too long. You're playing the joke out, and it, and it wouldn't and it wouldn't have worked anymore as a parallel. Because remember, we read about Peter Boyle was supposed to be doing a lot of ums from the clot from the bathroom. Right. They got rid of all that. Yeah, He's just sitting much. in bed quiet. So it doesn't make sense to have this re- repetition for the sake of Gene Wilder's character because there's no parallel. There's no reason to do it. Yeah, Yeah, there was actually a similar scene in Blazing Saddles where Madeline was uh, seducing uh, Black Bart Sheriff, where she, you know, I think she was in the whorehouse and he comes in there and she turns out the light and they're trying to make it out. Mm -hmm. She does a similar thing where she's like, oh, is it, you know, is it Twoo? Is it Twoo? Then you hear a zipper. Oh, it's Twoo. You know, that kind of thing. It's Twoo. They figured one movie with that sort of reference would be enough. I like what they're doing with this a little bit better. I like the fact that it's it's a it's a camera push in. He crawls into bed. He does the Frankenstein monster, but he doesn't do the herky jerky. He does a he gets into bed, crawls in. She curls up next to him, and she asks him as she's cuddling. There's something I've always wanted to ask you about that operation. You know, in the transference part, the monster got part of your wonderful brain. But what did you ever get from him? You know, so I'm just wondering, you know, what, what did you get anything from the monster? Just in time for that camera to be right up in his face. He has almost that smile. Like to zoom in on yeah. the eyes. And he's like, yeah. It even, a bit, uh, it even gets a bit grainy. They zoom in too far. Right. It is too far. And he's like, yeah, I, I got something from the monster. Let me, let me show you. <laughs> Let's have an intellectual discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then once again the sweet mystery of life reference and outside. And, and you notice that he has the reverse Hitler going. Yeah, it, his mustache has been all over the place. Yep. But one thing that I found kind of interesting is in this shot, it's so dark in the room that you can't see his hair. And you can just barely kind of see an outline of of his hair. But uh, you can't see how wild it is. Like Dave said, there's the top hat that's yeah. black that's covering yep. the top, and you only see just a just slight a hint just a shame of uh, coming from behind his head. Yep. But where through the course of the movie, that has been a big emphasis when you see him. Uh, you can barely see it here. So the final shot before we get to the castle and the pullback is... We got to get Marty Feldman. We got to get Igor one more time. And he's playing that funky ram's horn. It's it's so funny. It's it's the swan it song. It sounds like a trombone, I think. It does. It's in terms of instrument. Yeah. 
But uh, yeah. yeah, he's playing that final horn, and we are then immediately from that, we pull down. The camera's shooting up at him. It's starting that pullback from the castle. The singers don't match at all the music coming no. out of that thing either. Oh, no, not at all. No, but that does, at this point, it doesn't matter. I, I don't even try to make it uh, sync up. More, like Gene, when he was playing the fiddle uh, a few minutes ago, it actually sounded pretty close to you know where it should be as far as each note on the bow. Well, he's but his fingering on that on that trumpet thing, he's all over the place, and it doesn't matter at this point. Right. No, he, he when Gene was doing it on the bridge several minutes back, he at least had the bow movements down to go with it. In this case, it's just Marty Feldman being Marty Feldman, you know? Yeah. So, well, I really like that they close like, I'm not a musician. Him. They know I'm not a musician. It's a comedy. Yuck it up. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I like that he is the last character that they show for a couple of reasons but one of the reasons is he is a little bit of a um a sad character he doesn't have anybody it's just him and uh, uh but i didn't think of it like that he's all by himself he is by himself lamenting lamenting by the uh window there yeah and one person who is absent as we close out is uh frau bluka <laughs> Well, she got her swan song down yeah. in the uh, yeah. private library where she was just looking through the little yeah. trap door inside the door. And she has the satisfaction of knowing that her boyfriend's <laughs> life work is uh, is complete. So it, it's interesting how they kind of wrap all the characters' endings here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you you have a, a Professor Inspector Kemp with no hand running out to the lumber yard, but I'm sure he, he's restoring again, the relationship. Probably there. got somebody on the lathe to kind of work out a new one. I'm sure he did. Probably bigger and better. I mean, it does. It For, for the few flaws we ran into a f- couple, a week or so, or two weeks back, it does end sort of nicely. We've got the, the bookends of Elizabeth and the creature. We've got Freddie and Inga. We see that, and I don't know that. It's sad necessarily for Igor. I think Igor is just Igor. He's like the he's dog. Igor, yeah. He's the family dog. Right. As long as he's around people, he's happy. He yes. doesn't have to have somebody specific for him. He just exists to be there for everybody else. And it's interesting because there are people who accept him, where he could have definitely been seen as an outcast of society and probably has been most of his life. He's around people who accept him and, and care for him. And he has his castle. <laughs> he, so, still, he still gets to ride the dumbwaiter. Yeah, he still gets to ride the dumbwaiter. But I, I think they did a great job of closing this out. And where uh, a lot of the uh, the characters have had a lot of turmoil. You know, Dr. Frankenstein, obviously, dealing with his identity and everything else. Inga, even, with um, kind of a missed romance, because she's definitely interested in the doctor. He's still interested in Elizabeth. He's still interested in his work. But they get together. Mm-hmm. Um, the the monster, obviously, finds peace. Uh, Madeline Kahn seems to have found something that she wants and likes. And um, everybody kind of ends ha- well, in, in, in Frau Bluka as well. Well, I know. I um, said this with Crystal Beth. There is very much that sense of and, – and Gene Wilder having grown up in a tradition of not just theater but Shakespeare as well. This is your typical format for a Shakespearean comedy. Everybody ends up with somebody that, that needs to be with somebody. It all wraps up. There are no deaths. Everyone's – it's a happy ending. That's that's what calls it the comedy. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're laughing the whole time. It right. just means it's not the tragedy of everybody dying. You know? Right. So it works so closure out. closure for everybody's character. Yes. Everyone's got a all nice – main character. Right. It all works out like it's supposed to. Well, and I think it points to a different future, too, where you were talking about Gene's idea was, you know, throw the, you know, throw the doctor off the cliff and end the Frankenstein lineage. Instead, here there, there's kind of a sense of redemption of the Frankenstein lineage. Mm-hmm. And you get the sense that moving forward, things are going to be different. Yeah. It's, I almost feel like Gene Wilder, way, though, right now. It's setting up a sequel where you can, instead of killing off the characters, they survive and... You know, who, there could be an even younger Frankenstein in a couple of years. Who knows? Well, given Hollywood, we'll probably have somebody will come yeah. along and decide, hey, wouldn't it be cool to tell the, the grandson of young Frankenstein? Uh, oh, my gosh. Yes. Teenage Frankenstein. Only we'll have uh, Michael Bay direct it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Bay does some good stuff. He's However, had some good stuff. That is, this would not be a Michael Bay. <laughs> you, no. you, you get that voice to come in that, you know. In a world where people are being resurrected, we go back to the original. Young Frankenstein's Frankenstein, younger Frankenstein. Oy vey. <laughs> Oy vey. <laughs> All right. I got to admit, I'm starting it's to feel a little like Gene Wilder at the end of filming because I know- I, I'm the same way. This is 
it's not technically it, but f- for the most part, this is it because we've got one minute left to go. And we just started scrolling the credits. So let's go ahead and let everybody know what we can, What we're, here's what we're planning to do. We have asked a, a handful of our guests to give us a chance to revisit with them by giving them a chance to monologue for three or four minutes of what they thought about Young Frankenstein being on the on the show, joining us on the podcast, whatever is in their heads. So we've got a compilation close coming up on Monday where we've got a return of, you know, some of our voices come back. Not everybody and everybody had the ability to record their own stuff. But we've got we're going to bring back at least a handful of guests who will help us close out officially minute 106 on Monday. So definitely come on back. You'll hear some of your favorites, get their thoughts, and it'll be just kind of a a different way to sort of close out Young Frankenstein. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. Everybody brought a little bit different feel and taste to the the movie and a different perspective on things. And um, But I, I really do appreciate how everybody has come to the table saying, this is a great movie. This is one of my favorite movies, and they've had fun with it. So right. um, I've heard a couple of the uh, uh, of the segments, but I haven't heard all of them. I'm really looking forward to hearing I them. I purposely am putting them all in the folder, and I'm waiting to listen to them all at once. So I don't know anything that anyone said so far. Well, let me tell you. No, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Sweet mystery of life. No. <laughs> All right, Dave. I know uh, you were trying to give it while the while the train was coming by, but very quickly, our last goodbye to our last guest. We have Dave D'Alessandro, who's been with us for the last two minutes of the live action portion of the movie. Dave, if someone is in, has enjoyed your insights, so they just want to learn a little bit more about you, or they want to check out your podcast, where do they go? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, me and my girlfriend do SeinfeldMinute.com. We analyze the episodes of Seinfeld, as you may have guessed, one minute at a time. We're doing a best of for the series. We're not doing every single episode. Nobody has got that much patience. <laughs> but, uh, we have a lot of fun with it. A lot of yucks. We had uh, a couple of guests on so far. Uh, we would like to have more. So if anybody wants to be a guest, just drop us uh, an email, SeinfeldMinute at gmail.com, or you can check out the website for all the information. And I think you, the last time you were with us, you told us what you try to do is pick maybe two or three possible episodes and put it on the website and let folks sort of weigh in which one do they want to see next. Yeah, we had a uh, voting poll on the site, uh, but since uh, since the last time we recorded, that app has been uh, discontinued by Blogger. So now I just have a, a short list of uh, sort of a top 10 episodes that we're considering doing. Excellent. And you, can send us a, you can send us an email on which one you prefer uh, that we do, and we'll uh, we'll go from there. Awesome. Well, I know uh, I know Walt is a huge Seinfeld fan. As we found out the last time we were on, we had a good 10, 15 minutes of a Seinfeld <laughs> minute yeah. episode at the end of a young Frankenstein minute episode. So uh, yeah, we do have a couple of minutes remaining in the Cheever letters. So if Walt wants to guest on, we'd be glad to have him on. Please feel free to schedule me. Yes. Walt would love that. That would be a yes. Walt. Yeah, that would be within the next uh, three to four months, I think. Okay. Yeah, let me know. All right, Walt, this is our last. Well, we've got one more, and we'll probably squeeze it in one more time. But for today, I'm Friday. jump in uh, one more second. Oh, sure. So you off again. <laughs> Doing if it all minute. If interested in jigsaw puzzles, you can check out Homer in 3D on YouTube, where you can watch me put together jigsaw puzzles. I've done a hot sauce bottle puzzle, and I've done a bacon puzzle. So, <laughs> no, it's just as exciting what? as you think it is. Now, is it at least in, uh, what do you call that, uh, time loop or time lapse film, or is it... Time lapse? No, no, it's only, um, they're only about 30 to 40 second uh, vlogs. So, <laughs> summing up for the day, how much I've accomplished and how much I've got left. Oh, okay. <laughs> I know it sounds quite strange from from your point of view, but for somebody like me, I would be all over that and I enjoy that kind. Of, think we've kind just of gotten the insight we needed to help explain who you really are. <laughs> if you didn't think I was a nerd at this point, I think that should solidify it. <laughs> well, we've now had Puzzle Man and uh, the Minute of Mime guy. We did have the five minutes of mime. <laughs> That's awesome, Walt. One more time to wrap up the work week. How do people? Well, how do people go back if they've just stumbled across us and said, "Holy crap! You did the entire movie!" I can go back now and start at the very beginning and binge to the end. How do they do it, folks? You got a hundred and five episodes to catch up on, and then our incredible finale that's coming. But the best place to find that is uh, going to be iTunes. 
And we really need your help. What we would love for you to do is go to iTunes, find The Wilder Ride there, which you're probably already listening uh, there, and take a second to give us a rating. If you're liking what you're hearing, a five-star rating would be greatly appreciated. And take a second just to uh, comment. And frankly, it doesn't matter what you say. We would appreciate a little good feedback uh, and how much you like the show. But even if you just tell us what your favorite sandal is or (laughs) what kind of ice cream you're eating at the time, that would be great because then your vote gets counted. I hope the metrics, I hope whatever the an, an, <laughs> systems are using will know that they just wrote gibberish. I like flip-flops. I just like... <laughs> <laughs> the Wilder Ride was fantastic because ice cream bones, blue, <laughs> banana. What the hell? I like Chunky Monkey. I like ch- <laughs> oh well, now that you mentioned that, the AI is going to kick in, so anything that's just gibberish will be dis- uh, dis- uh, distanced from the rest of the uh, we'll real be, reviews. We'll be the only podcast in history that has reviews that actually derank us. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> It's Half like, a star? How's this possible? Your <laughs> listeners are more insane than the host. It's like, wait a minute. They got all these five stars, but they're, they've been relegated to obscurity. Where are they? <laughs> the, well, the Amazon could, AI says no. <laughs> go, go in and make an actual comment. <laughs> an that, actual would be, comment. that would be helpful, and we would really appreciate that. That would be a great help to us. It helps people find us, which is the most important thing when they search for Gene Wilder or uh, any of the other folks involved or Frankenstein or Young Frankenstein. And then also we would appreciate it if you'd uh, go out to Pell. Uh, Peloton. Go ride a bike for a little while. Go to patreon.com slash the wilder ride. Uh, consider helping us out a little bit. We've got some expenses. And please, if you haven't already, go to facebook.com slash the wilder ride. Follow us there and then join the listeners group and get involved in the conversations going on. If you haven't yet, it's a great time to join because we'll be dropping some special episodes between now and the end of the year just to keep us fresh and in your mind. And at some point, there'll be a big reveal for season two. We're still working on, well, we've kind of like with uh, the Seinfeld Minute with polls, we're kind of taking our own internal polls, deciding what's going to be movie number two. But you're going to, much like you don't to ask a pregnant woman right after birth, do you want another one? We, we need it. We need some time, <laughs> but we are already thinking about season two so you'll want to be part of the listeners group for that folks i'm going to say as we close out to all the listeners everyone whether you've been with us from day one or you stumbled across it and it's two years three years into our into our podcast thanks for being here thanks for helping listen and hopefully sharing the enjoyment with friends and family I know we try to give you a lot of information. We try to give you at least something with each minute. But ultimately, my goal is for people who come back to me and say, I laughed. I enjoyed it. I forgot about my problems for a little bit. We have a lot of people going through a lot of things who are listening to this podcast right now who have told us those kinds of things. And honestly, that's why we do it. We want people to be entertained, to feel good. And even if it's just for 30 minutes, you're transported to hearing two goofballs making you laugh, that that's okay. Yeah, and and for uh, one of our listeners, Melissa, with her fight um, against cancer, we really appreciate you listening and appreciate your comments, and we think about you every day, and um, and we're with you in the fight. All right, Dave, thanks so much for closing out the film with us, for being our, our, a recurring guest, being here a, a second time with us on this Wilder Ride. I really appreciate what you've done and, and helping us as well with a couple of other guest coordinations. Oh, yeah, it was my pleasure. And folks... Come back Monday. We've got our finale, our wrap-up, our extravaganza to close this out. A recap with some of our guests of this, The Wilder Ride. And it's going to be great when we start next year doing the movie...